All of the views and opinions expressed here are those of the individual speaking and may not be representative of Coding American. At times, language may be considered vulgar. Listener discretion is suggested. You are now listening to the Coding Behind the Wheel podcast. Oh man, are we going to talk about the royal wedding? Is that on our agenda? I don't think it's going to be on there. Okay. All right. Next episode. All right. Uh, we're live. Uh, welcome to a special episode of the Behind the Wheel podcast. I'm Scott. I'm the marketing director for Koenig Wheels. With me is Joey Redman. Joey is the founder of Rec Magazine and has been published in over 20 automotive magazines. Additionally, he has built SEMA vehicles for OEs like Hyundai and Ford. Finally, you can find his 10 Things Learned article available on formuladrift.com after each event. In case you missed the first one after FD Orlando, Joey and I are going to get together after each FD event, briefly run through some thoughts and highlights from the event. This will be in addition to our regular podcast format, so make sure you check for the next one after round four, which is wall. So I guess before we get into it, we're going to try to change up the format a little bit. Um, We're going to try to shorten a little bit from last time. And I believe we're going to just try to go through your points, maybe a little bit out of order, but your points directly from um, FD, FD's website. So I guess give me a quick, uh, give me a quick overlo- overall view of what you felt about Atlanta this year. Uh, it wasn't the best Atlanta ever, yeah. uh, but probably, it probably wasn't the worst. It, it was somewhere... In the middle, I think. Well, it had these great. Uh, I had a couple really good battles, but it just didn't have that like standout moment that you're going to remember for the rest of time. Yeah, I get that. It's hard. I I really like Atlanta. Like for me, I'll even venture to say that Atlanta is one of my more favorite events from the season. Okay. I like I like the downhill. I, I like how fast it goes. Um, I like, no, I love uh, how the drivers struggle so hard with that first clip. Not mm-hmm. all of them, but I, I just really enjoy that. Um, and just like a wrestling match, for some reason, I have this love-hate relationship with the kitty litter section right after that first clip. Um, I, I'm devastated to watch him roll into it, but I kind of giggle like a schoolgirl every time it happens. So that's kind of weird. Um, so there's that, um, but I love the horseshoe. Um, I love the return and I think more than anything else, there really is a different vibe and maybe I've been there a couple of times. I think there's a totally different vibe in Atlanta, their, their whole fans compared to any other event. And I like that. So there's that. Yeah. I think the fans in Atlanta are fun for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, it 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 seemed a little. I actually sat in a different place than I have sat uh, for every round, pretty much in Atlanta. Right. And so, like, maybe my perspective was like a little different in that standpoint, but um, it was hot. I think too. They just it's the energy level. Yeah, but the I don't know the the energy level is maybe missing a little bit. But I don't know. I might be overanalyzing the the event as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I guess starting from the top or abruptly somewhere in the middle from your points on Formula Drift's website, you said, so point number seven, uh, you said pro two, best of times, worst of times. Uh, and I think you were referring here to the top pro two guys look better than the bottom five pro one guys. Yeah, I mean, maybe even like the bottom ten pro guys. Like, I'm, I might even just right. double down on that a little bit. That was that's a hard statement. There's a there's a good amount of people in the bottom of pro, that you know that top ten, the bottom ten in pro that have some skill level there. So that's a that, I mean, I think that's a big statement. Um, yeah, I mean, no one in the bottom ten is really sticking out to me like no none of them have done anything this year i mean the only guy i think that could be hard done by in the bottom 10 of fd is maybe kyle mohan okay uh i think he had a really close battle in top 32 he pushed it one more time i think he was a little i don't want to say he was hard done by but like 
he's maybe like not quite deserving to be in the bottom um <clears throat> in the bottom 10 I'm trying to remember who mohan battled in the top 32 oh odie yeah it was like it was a respectable battle like mohan did pretty good uh i think jeff jones too he had like a pretty good um his battle with force wang was actually pretty decent as well um he pushed force to two one more times right one or two um but I don't know, like some of these other guys in this bottom ten, man. Like I almost think I'd rather see some of these pro two guys in there. Well, like. so let's and let's just recap: pro two, top five, um, Sexsmith, Literal, Reader, Hughes, and Jaeger. Um, I'm a big fan of Travis Reader. I'm, of course, I'm completely biased. I think I think he's incredibly efficient. I and I, I just talk about this in the in episode two with Caleb Quanbeck. Okay. Um, they're, they're friends. They have been for a long time. So, all right, he's biased too, but he runs an incredibly efficient program. So we kind of discussed that there too. Uh, he works for nameless performance and he's been around, you know, Turk's program and some of the bigger drift programs for a long time. He really understands what it takes to run a program, what to build a reliable car out of a program. And he does it extremely efficiently. Um, and for all those reasons, I like him. Uh, yeah. Ryan literal is fantastic and awesome to watch. I just really enjoy him. He's just really slow, but yeah. I you know I didn't think he was that slow in that in that Coral Works three fifty Z. You you do. Yeah. All right. I mean, there's a reason that Riley Sexsmith ran into him. Like, all right, I'm, I'll give it to you four times. All right. <laughs> you have to bring out <laughs> proof. Proof like destroys every argument. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess it's still an opinion, but um, I don't know. The live stream sometimes is really hard to distinguish speed, I think. Fair. Fair. Um, but but even going so, – so those are your top five guys in Pro 2. But now going into, going into the bottom five uh, of – well, no. Well, we, you said 10. I'm going to hold you to the 10. Okay. So going into the bottom 10, uh, let's see here. Mohan, Jeff Jones. Mm-hmm. I like Kearney. how you skip one of them, but yeah. Uh-huh. Listen, I'm. <laughs> I'm just. <laughs> you said uh, you said ten, so I'm allowed to draw from anywhere within the bottom ten. That's how okay. it goes. I mean, uh, Dean Kearney is probably a fluke. He's not. Gonna, I would imagine he's probably not going to finish in the bottom ten. Hilbrun. Um. I mean, Hilbrun is been eliminated in top 32 twice and not qualified once. I think any of those pro two guys could do that. Okay. I mean, first off qualifying, there's only 32 drivers. There's only yeah. been so like, yeah, basically Alex Hillbrun has successfully put together two qualifying runs this year. That's it. Right. And lost two tandem battles and then didn't, uh, was he in, I don't, I can't even remember that from qualifying. Was he there? Was he just like missing from Atlanta? No, he was there. He didn't qualify, right? For whatever reason. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I see your point. It's valid. I'll give you that. I think this might be a good segue to have that promised Pro One versus Pro Two conversation from the first uh, FD one that we did together. Uh, yeah. After Orlando. I you know I don't know. It's like I almost um, I actually got I, I'm like currently in an argument on our Facebook page. Uh, because some kid was clowning me for praising Matt Van Kirk. And he was like, oh, maybe if he qualified better, he would, you know, he wouldn't lose to Frederick Osbo every round. Because, you know, he lost to Osbo in Long Beach and Road Atlanta. Right. And I was like, guy, or uh, sorry, in Orlando. And I was like, guy, he qualified 16th in Orlando. Yeah. Like, what do you want from the kid? Like, his second ever event, and this and that. Anyway, we were going back and forth, and... You know, other than me being right, like the other big takeaway is like, <laughs> I just don't think, you know, his whole argument was he's like, well, he's not a rookie. He's driven in pro am in in pro two. And I'm like, you know, maybe I'm a little too close to drifting and I, I just see the differences. But like, you know, pro two happens on the same weekend as Formula D. But the the speed and the level that everything yeah. happens at is just so different, man. Like. 
you think you know you think being in pro two is gonna prep you for formula d like it might a different playing field yeah i mean i you know i think you look at the guys who transcend out of pro two and become successful have some kind of connection to like a pro team in a way like you know um for example like alex hilbrun was like the you know, at one point was like the shining star of Formula D, but like he employs the services of RTS yeah. to build, maintain and spot his car. And, you know, he's been involved with numerous uh, pro teams. Like, you know, while Alex maybe wasn't like up to speed, like he had guys around him that like knew what it took to get done, you know, and, and bringing up your buddy, Travis reader, you're, you're seeing yeah. Cable talk about him. Like, Honestly, it's it's probably a, a competitive advantage. Like, I don't think it's a surprise that the number one and number two driver from Pro Two in Atlanta both had pro drivers as their spotters. Yeah, of course. You know, but there, uh, but I don't, I don't want to mention names, but there were a few other people that had in Pro Two that had pros spotting them, and they couldn't put it together. I mean, they did okay, but. Well, listen, just because you've got Chris Forsberg as your spotter for sure doesn't mean that you're going to win an event. Right. Like you still have to bring a lot, uh, you know, on your own. No, um, of, co- of course, I'm... you know, th- that's not the end all be all. But I guess what I'm saying is I think when you are surrounded with a pro team, I think you tend to do better in pro two because pro two I used to feel really negative about it. I, I think I've become increasingly positive over the years. I'm willing to say like my anti pro two stance is, mm, I kind of take it back a little bit. I think honestly they should grow it to more rounds. Yeah, I um, for sure. I get the whole four rounds thing, but it's like, you know, if it's really supposed to be a feeder series, like if you can't afford to run four rounds, if you can't afford to run five or six rounds in pro two, I don't know how you're going to magically get the money to be in pro the year after. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, and I also think that there's a time element there, right? They've juggled the season around more specifically this year, I think, to try to tighten up the rounds. Because what it was like last year and a couple of years before that, there'd be such a gap between some of the events. It, it would yeah. be, talk about, like, just undramatic. It, you get to the end and you'd almost forget that there was even a series there. So yeah, I think yeah, they, yeah. Did, okay. they did a better attempt to try to do that, but... I do think that, you know, you go to a five or six round series, at least helps to tighten up that gap. And I think that when you talk about the difference between Pro 1 and Pro 2, even if you would have Pro 2, if you would have Pro 2 level drivers and two different fields where one ran eight and the other ran four in the same time span, there's a big difference in in running and maintaining a program that's able to do that and hit those events and prep a, and prep a car and have this, and have everything done and maintain the car for for that many events yeah for sure so and there's and then so let's just talk about and there's a huge difference i don't think people may not appreciate how drastic the cars are built and powered um pro one to pro two there's a big difference there and then obviously there's the there's the talent and skill level correct yeah i mean one of the problems is you know uh horsepower Horsepower can mask and make up for a lot of problems in drifting, but the problem is with can horsepower. Make a lot too. Well, I don't think so. I think horsepower really? is actually a net. Um, well, I think horsepower is a net positive as far as you having it and your driving ability. Horsepower can correct a, a large number of issues. The problem is the more horsepower you get, the more reliability problems you're going to have and the more cost that you're going to intake so for a program that is on a budget you've got to find that balance of horsepower reliability and maintenance cost whereas some of these uh higher budget or say like no budget teams can just kind of you know go all out in that in that case yeah, and there's still and there's still Pro One cars that are 
you know, well, we made reference to it last time where we consider them or we referred to them as underpowered, but they're very reliable machines. Well, <laughs> sort of. But <laughs> but I think that there's there's a piece there. I, I don't think people understand that. And, and you really can watch the difference between um, some of the higher horsepower, even Pro-Am guys, how they, they eat tires at a way faster rate. It changes the tire management completely. There's a lot of more reliability issues. It's almost like a double-edged sword. Yeah, it's great to have um, kind of in competition, but then you come up with this other piece that you have to maintain that car, and they break a lot more. There's just a lot more reliability pa- uh, issues that come up with those cars, and that's why if you look at some of the guys that are drifting in a more hobby fashion and hitting some of these you know, more fun competitions, they're very satisfied with 300, 350 horsepower cars that they can drive all day long yeah totally so i don't know um i guess pro the pro rookie of the year race that was your you you know your point number five um your point number five the the rookie of the year race is tighter than ever and i'm we're talking about uh the dirk versus van kirk matchup um one point between them Correct, and I mean they're both they're both solid drivers, and they're both I don't know they have a, they have a good amount of Pro Two experience. Well, <laughs> one season, but yeah, and I mean we might be sleeping on Taguchi. I mean he might put something together. I wouldn't count Austin Meeks out. Uh, right. I mean te- technically the championship uh, is a little misleading um because i think 22nd to to like 26th place is all a tie uh because they've basically all lost all three rounds in top 32 yeah um so you know with that being said like van kirk and dirk stratton are basically separated by a, a qualifying point essentially right um long beach and dirk basically out qualified van kirk um is like the only like point difference that they're carrying right now um you know it's about any of them i i that's i guess that's the interesting thing is like anybody at this point i think is available to Austin Meeks, uh, Frederico and his Ferrari, um, you know, he's down there, but he's not really out. I mean, yeah, like I, it's just interesting because the last couple of years, I mean, we've had what I consider some controversial rookies of the year, um, you know, allowing, I think the rules for the rookie of the year should be rewritten. Uh, like perhaps if you're a champion in another, another series, series. Yeah, I don't think you should be considered. I mean, for you know, crap's sake, we'll say keep it a little PG around here. I mean, Daigo Saito won the championship and rookie of the year. Yeah. In 2012, like Daigo Saito's not a rookie, you know. I mean, come on. But right. it, I think I'm just enjoying what I would consider like a traditional rookie of the year race. Right. Uh, Tagushi being, I guess, the one like asterisk there. Um, I pretty sure he's formula drift champion or formula drift japan champion right uh, if not he's been very active over there for a while but you know until he goes out and wins an event and makes a big impact i don't think anyone's gonna cry foul on him exactly yeah so i think the qualifying point qualifying run thing is interesting uh your point number three about pollock's your point number three reading it verbatim is justin pollock's second qualifying run was incredible I think the summary here um, is really that teams are stepping up their game in the uh, stepping up stepping up their qualifying game, and we've seen higher qualifying runs than we've probably seen ever before. Um, I wouldn't say ever. I mean, there's been events on a consistent there basis, though, like that. Um, probably. I mean, you you know, it it's one. It's kind of difficult to compare apples to apples. The the judging has progressed over the years. Right. Um, so I, I think that's part of it as well. Like, um, 
Uh, I don't know how to articulate, but I think you can basically split Formula D into four versions. Uh, like basically there's like Formula D 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Formula D 1.0 I basically think should be like erased from the history books, like for a quick breakdown. Uh, I mean, it was basically when guys were driving their, you know, Von Gitt Jr., I think, drove his 240SX to Atlanta and then drifted in. Like, eh, it was part of Formula D, but it wasn't. You know, it's yeah. like Sam Hubinet had a factory backed Viper program, won pretty much everything. It's like, you know, whatever. Formula D 2.0, I think we was probably the years between like 07 and 20, maybe 11, 2010. Um, I think the judging was really just kind of inconsistent and weird. And then I think to overcompensate, you went into like Formula D 3.0, where the rules became very, very um, exact and outlandish. Yeah. Like, I don't know, you know, uh, real quick point on that. It's like there was a, an event at West Palm Beach where Forsberg was battling Essa and they passed this little part of the track that it had like cones on it. And Forsberg passed the cones in his exhaust. He was so close to the cone, his exhaust blew the cone over after passing it, and he got a zero for that. Yeah. And I think that was like the dark days of, of Formula D. And now <laughs> I, th- I think Formula D 4.0 is like we're like at peak Formula D 4.0. Like I think drivers are given a much more of a license to be creative, be expressive. I think they're encouraged to have style. So, you know, I think there is part of that, though, too, is like, while we haven't seen those scores that consistently, I think part of it is just that drivers are being awarded for being exciting and unique and stylish. Like, there's motivation to that, where I think in years past, it wasn't. It was literally like, hey, go to this clip, go to that clip, be done. Well, but I, and one of the other things you tackle in the same point is the fact about, let's go back to the elusive hundred, uh, hundred point, uh, qualifying run there. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know your point was, you really think it's coming sooner or later this season, but we've seen some pretty good runs already. We've seen some really close runs that some could argue maybe deserve the hundred point. Maybe, you know, it, it's interesting how I think uh, back when Tanner Faust achieved the only 100-point run in drifting, I think now in modern-day Formula D, that runs probably like a 92 to 95. Yeah, right. You go back and look at it. You know, one of the problems now is that the judges all have an individual score. So to get a 100-point run back then I, I don't remember exactly how it worked back then but it was kind of like more general consensus right? right so now it's like literally one judge is judging um you know a uh, line angle and style so you're being critiqued i think much more in a complex way by each judge so i think just the likelihood of the 100 point run is much harder now right I, I mean, I get that. Um, your point number eight, you talk about Turek looking really dialed. Um, and your point, I think your point there was Dean could have potentially, well, no, he could have potentially ended up on the podium provided that Dean didn't beat him. Block yeah. Him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they had some good battles. If you go back, like, I think I would have maybe waited Turek to win the original battle. I think right. Dean kind of took the one more time. It was close. Um, I was actually sitting on the track opposite the uh, camera angles, basically. So, like, where you were watching the event, like, I'm kind of seeing the opposite. Like, when they're going up the hill, I'm looking at the back of their cars. Um, so, I actually thought Turek won both. And then when I rewatched the event, when I got home, I was like, oh, and the one more time, like Turk's mistakes are much more uh, evident uh, on the live yeah. stream. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think the judges kind of made the right call. It was tough. But, you know, I think if he could have just snuck past Dean, who's like the, you know, unbeatable force of Formula D, I, I think he could have definitely made a, a good run to the finals there. Yeah. 
I've been dying to shove point four in there because I I really like Castro. So this is a really this is a really good interesting piece of uh, of formula drift that probably hasn't been um, tackled yet. But so so point four Castro DNF um, raises an interesting question. And the point you're trying to there your point you're talking about there is that um, there was contact mm-hmm. uh, in the in their first run. Correct. Um, and with that, there there was damage occurred, but not really caught. Right. So so Castro comes back and he's given it, he's given the chance to check over his vehicle. Uh, again, they went red. He battled red. Dan. He gave him yeah, a chance I mean, after the contact. He's given his chance to check over his vehicle. Correct. And he's, I mean, I would. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say like a legend. I mean. Alleged. All right, I get what you. I get where you're going with this. Let's hypothetically say that contact occurred. He was given chance. He was. It was enough of contact that he was given a chance to check over his vehicle. To Correct. Which he gave the thumbs up and said, "All good. Everything looks good. I'm ready to go." They line back up. They go for the second run. Then his wheel falls. Then his. <laughs> in the same spot that he was just hit. Allegedly. Correct. <laughs> well, I. It wasn't alleged that he was hit. It's like <laughs> you implied that you know. I, I guess where I stand is like, you know, we don't, that's, I guess the whole crux of my point is like, we don't know how, you know, how far in the future can you hold contact accountable for right. an accident? Of course. I, I mean, I get that's where you were going. So, so the point is right now, um, you know, once a, once a driver basically has, look, has a look at his vehicle and says, Hey, everything's great. We're ready to line up again. They line up again. They run. They run, uh, and they start the run. They've kind of been relieved of any issue there. Like you're, you're not going to go back and say, "Oh, well, even though he said everything was okay, it really wasn't." Obviously, so technically, we'll just give him the win. That doesn't happen. They don't. They don't re- go retro retro back to uh, to something and and have judgment there. So your point is maybe they should. Maybe there should be some sort of way of of looking at it and saying, okay, there's, there was contact there that really led to the fault at which that, you know, that DNF happened and there should be consequence. Yeah. I don't know. It's tough. I mean, I think the, the closest example that I think comes to mind is like, I think in like, say the case of like formula one, I think that would be like reviewed by a panel. Right. And then likely I think what would happen in that case is that, everything would stand in like the rad Dan say is like a formula one driver would receive like a time penalty, right? Like, a yeah. Added to a score. Like obviously you can't add a time penalty, but right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't know. Like it, it's just concerning, I guess. You know, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm still really torn about this one. It, it's one of those things that like you want to be clear cut, but you know, rad Dan basically, if you want to assume that the contact, you know, came from Rad Dan's contact, which I believe and I think most rational people are going to come right. to that same conclusion. Right. You know, Rad Dan basically crashed into somebody, their car broke, and then he advanced on. Like, that's obviously not, you know, no one feels good, I think, about that result. Sure. But it does, but it does bring up an interesting point, which is teams really need to do their diligence. I mean, I'm, I know they already do. Anybody who's listening to me is like, this guy's an idiot. But, but, I, they really need to do as much as they can to check over the vehicle. And the reason is because it really would be a very, very difficult rule to pass. To what extremes does it go? To, at, at what point are you going to, you know, could you potentially say, a ru- you know, a run happens, some damage occurs, you know, or, or contact's made, and then they go back and they say, oh, well, our suspension was really tweaked. We didn't realize it. It changed the way the car performed and and because of that, there was there was a there was a fault. I mean, a wheel coming off is a little bit more obvious, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I you know, I think there's just part of the problem too is when you're on one of these crews, it's like there's the, I think the pressure to go on, right? Like the heat of the show. Like there's, right. um, you know, it, it's not dealing in like a normal circumstance. There's a lot of outside factors. You know, I think if you're just at a pro event and some guy whacks you and you can look at your car, like odds are you're probably going to like take the wheel off and yeah. inspect things and, and right. stuff like that. So 
Um, I don't know. You, you got to see whose fault you put that out. Like Castro got hit, completed that whole run. Um, you know, Castro might have just told his crew guys, like, hey, my car's fine. Feels great. Right. And the guys are like, okay, like, you're not going to argue with your driver, but, you know, maybe the crew guy should. And, I don't know. It, I know. it was it's just a, one of those things that it, it, I think it's a one in 15 years incident. Like, it's not the end of Formula Drift as we know it, but it, it's, right. it's an interesting one. And it's, a, and it's and it'd be an extremely complicated rule. Um, but what isn't a complicated rule is the light jump that happened in the Kaufman versus Gucci match. That wasn't yeah, a that wasn't a complicated thing and your point's pretty clear that Kaufman jumps the light and it was Gucci that had to go back and basically say, Hey, what what's up with this? Like why why was there no uh penalization that happened here? Yeah, it's a complicated one. Um, you know, easy answer, you'd imagine there'd be a camera on the light, on the starting light. And right now they just currently have a judge, correct? Uh, well, there's judge like a... not the right a, word, but, it's, but somebody yeah. that spots that. Yeah, so the evolution of Formula D, there was a starter, right? He point, you know, driver gives thumbs up, he points the driver gives thumbs up. Very fast At and one furious point, like. Yeah, very. At one point, he was the one that, you know, like, started the race, we got a light... Yeah. I think he's actually the one that triggers the light. I don't know that for a hundred percent fact, but okay. I think he's standing there. I think where it gets to be a gray area is that a lot of guys do jump the light uh, when they know they're a slower car, right? Like and it's almost you, like just kind of not looked at, right? It's just kind of like yeah, and well, well, right. Like I, you know, I think okay, like if you're Daigo Saito who had a notoriously fast car, and I think if he jumped the light. Everyone's going to cause a stink. I think uh, in current terms, if Kristaps jumped the light on a guy who's slow, like Forrest Wang, yeah, I think everyone's going to notice. Forrest Wang jumps the light on Kristaps. It's like more in the spirit of the show. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't want like a rule or anything set up about that, but like I think what should be addressed is like that guy on the starting line should probably at least radio in and say. I don't think he needs to be making any kind of like um, racing decision, but I think he should be radioing to um, race control. It used to be Doug. I don't know who runs it now, but and say like, <coughs> you know, cough first and then right. but be like Kaufman jumped the light. Right. Gucci jumped the light. Kristaps uh, jumped the light. Like just announcing like, so it's on record. And so then when they're like, hey, why was Kangushi 14 cars behind? There's some coffee? way of looking and verifying, hey, this could have potentially been why. I mean, this didn't right, happen like, the right way. I think the light gets jumped a lot for uh, a net a net positive, right? Like people are jumping yeah. the light to increase the level of the show. I don't think anyone wants to get rid of that. But um, a sneaky one, an interesting one. And like I think Kangushi could have easily kept quiet and no one would have been the wiser. So, Except for the fact that that him calling attention did happen to overturn that result. Correct. So they had to go so he overcalled it. I think at the end of top thirty two, the judges and race control reviewed it, agreed with Kengushi, and then at the beginning of top sixteen they re ran the battle. Right. So for him, he could have kept quiet, but he would have taken that L. So, yeah, no, I, I good for him, but I, I also just think that I don't think it should have gone that far. That long. Like, yeah, yeah, like somebody, I don't know, from, from what I heard, I don't know this to be a fact, but like basically it was verified through GoPro footage, and I'd have to imagine it was Ken Gushi's GoPro footage. Um, which brings up a whole other issue, which means that there's no. There's no record of it. There's no, right, like you said before, there's no camera of it. There's no way that formula D, if it was a word versus word without any proof of somebody supplied GoPro, that there would really would have been. No yeah, like imagine there. if Ken Gushi's camera guy didn't put batteries in his GoPro. And so like that wasn't recorded. Like to right. me, the fact that like Ken Gushi is having to like submit his own GoPro footage to when a protest feels very um, archaic when we're dealing with like a TV production and 
all these things going on. Well, and it may not have been his GoPro. I mean, we don't know that. I mean, for the ma- they do they do put a bunch of GoPros on the car right before every car starts, and I believe that's that's Formula Drift doing that. That is correct. So it could have been it could have easily been one of their things, and we could be off. So everybody should know that, like. Obviously, we don't know the exact intricate workings, and we're not trying to hold them to a different thing, but it did take quite a while for them to do it, and one can make the argument, what if that didn't progress far enough, and they started top 16? Yeah, totally. Um, your point number one... Well, I don't even... Let's not even go there yet. Um, okay. Point. Your point 10 was... James Dean seems to have something that has been his kryptonite for the season, uh, which you you called you said you know is it a BMW? But really, we're talking about Kristaps, right? Oh, and yeah. two, they line up together, and Dean's a great driver. So, so oh, and two is a is a pretty big statement against another driver. Well, it's, you know, I think I pointed out in my article, he's only lost to two drivers, uh, two drivers twice. It's a little tricky to say. Right. Which is Chris Forsberg, who he's beat three times, lost twice to, and... Kristoff. Kristoffs, who he's right. never beat. I actually honestly wish there was an easier access to European records. I, I'd be really curious to know how many times Kristoffs and Dean met in Europe right. and who what. I tried to do a little bit of research, and honestly, it got to be too complicated really fast. So I just kind of let it go. But no, I, I get that. Yeah, that's interesting. And and the truth is, going right on to point number one, um, Kristaps wins. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's it. He gets his he gets his revenge. And what's interesting to me, and I think we mentioned this the first time, was. He was a driver that I've seen now at least two times in an interview formally say that, um, you know, and, and whether you thought it was an ego thing or not, he formally said, you know, I'm, I'm a great driver. I'm one of the best. I'm one of the most talented out here. And um, what's keeping me from, from winning is myself. It's his own self. It's its own head. So I think that this is a feather in his cap toward defending that statement. I think it's. Um, I, I think, think he gives yeah. the best interviews in Formula D. By by the way, I know. <laughs> yeah, like, he, does. he does. I wish that the thing is, other drivers think like him, but they like they don't say it. <laughs> yeah, they don't say it. And I love. Um, I forget what battle it was after. Uh, he's the Conor McGregor of Formula D. Kinda in a way, like yeah. there was this battle with. I think it was uh, Forrest. After the two one more times, he was like, she was like, oh, what do you think you have to do to win? Uh, Lorette, who does the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live stream. The, he goes... Right, live stream. Well, he goes, I had better line. I had better proximity. He goes, I just looked better than him drifting all around the track, but uh, the judges didn't agree, so I'm just going to go do it again. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I'm the truth is, quoting. like... You know what you go. What do they say about Muhammad Ali? They um they asked you know I've heard people say this before like why did Muhammad why was Muhammad Ali the best in the world and the answer is because he kept telling you he was right so I think there's like a part of that but then the other piece is like I mean he he defended it he flat out got out there he won he showed everybody that's what it is so can't knock it you know that's how that goes yeah I think you know he has some unique issues unlike other teams yeah um you know his crew chief like speaks almost zero english i'm pretty sure well and so well yes but the i this is the problem is like so they kind of run a skeleton crew because the problem with his crew chief not speaking english is like they can't uh you know go get local like a lot of these teams rely on like Local guys or like semi local drift fans right. or like right. pro am drivers to be like, hey, go break down these tires. Hey, change the toe to this. Or, you know, we need to dial this, in, you know, we need this air pressure. Yeah. So when they have the budget, they bring a couple extra guys from Latvia, but obviously that gets inherently expensive. Oh, because of the flights. <laughs> right. And right. You know, and stuff. Right. So, um, they usually end up running like a skeleton crew of like three people. Yeah. And so I think that's 
you know, when you compare to someone like Von Gittin Jr., who probably has a crew of 10, you know, at, at a race yeah, weekend. of course. Um, I think it's like a big hurdle. Like, it's definitely like a unique um, circumstance or like issue that exists for sure. I mean, maybe him. they just need to invest in a whiteboard and a whistle. I maybe you know <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, so what are you gonna do? Um, I mean, you know, maybe you can start studying up and uh, join the team for next year. I don't think anybody would want me on their team. <laughs> so Atlanta, the one thing that stati- characteristically was a little bit different for Atlanta this year were the hits. We had three, even though I can't remember the third. Um, three really good crashes, right? There was okay. Field, and then mm-hmm. Burns that Pro 2. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember for the life of me who the third one was in Pro 2. It was right at the end. Uh, they had just crossed the finish line. I thought it was against Reader. They just crossed the finish line. Uh, the winning, uh, well, one of the car, yeah, continued up the hill. I really think it was, I think it was, I, I personally, I know you... I think it was the match against Reader. I, for some reason, think it was because it was after the finish line. It doesn't matter. Anyhow, um, so the question, I think your point was, what, like, what changed here that caused these crashes to mm. kind of happen in Atlanta this year? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, they moved the starting cones back, uh, and I addressed that with two of the judges i think maybe all three and they kind of pointed out to me that last year people were basically initiating before the cones so they just moved the cones back so the drivers would have a reference point yeah. and maybe that just mentally got into their head you know i would personally say that in pro 2 it was probably a mistake to leave the cones back there like they probably should have brought them back in um i think the pro 2 guys really struggled with entering that far back but yeah. you know at the same time, like you're trying to replicate the what pro, pro series, for them. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. That's a hard one. I just, you know, normally you don't you you kind of look at the series and you go, man, if my car can make it through Long Beach and Orlando, then like, eh, this series is a little easier on cars. I mean, you've kind of got a little bit of a problem with wall. It tends to eat one car really hard, but then. You know, St. Louis is not very threatening to your vehicle. Texas isn't. Uh, Irwindale can be, but it's, I don't know, a little more forgiving, I think, than some of these other banks. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just kind of shocking to me. I mean, feel, uh, there's not great footage. If you go on his Instagram, he's got, like, a video where, like, you can see this thing far away hit the wall and smoke. But, like, I, w- I mean, I was told, like, his trunk flew over the catch fence. Uh, and like landed on the spectator side of the track. I mean, it was Thursday, so there wasn't really anyone there. Yeah, I think that RX seven that John crashed is 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 total. I mean, yeah, that was that he, was a really hard hit. He put that into the wall like straight. I yeah. mean, uh, I mean, without a Hans device and, and some of you know a well built cage. I mean, that could have been uh, devastating. Yeah, that's a good word. Yeah. And, and it would and it would be a, a crash and it crashed an injury um for 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 formula drift that that would ch- i think i believe that that would be a, a really big stir issue that could potentially change things i mean they're already pretty i will say they're pretty good on safety and tech i agree so so to have to leap up and bound and change rules at that point could really change the way the series and some of these cars are powered or developed or et cetera that may make the sport less exciting. It's kind of like the same thing with NASCAR, what they had went through for a number of years. Right. Um, so I think before wrapping this whole thing up, cause we've cleared some through a lot of your points, the one point I think we should touch on, I promise we would, and we're going to end off every podcast with it is the, the end of the season podium for pro. Okay. We, we, we talked about revisiting that again, because of the prediction that we talked about of statistically how we end up with, you know, after we get through the first couple of events, that podium doesn't really change because of the spread, the margins there. Okay. Um, Are you going to predict first or, or me? No, I don't. 
I don't predict. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't predict, I'm never wrong. So I'm going to just let you go through it. And, and I mean, look, it, it, it's happening. The, the spread's still there. We're still seeing it. So why don't you go ahead and call it out? I think right now I see the season ending. <clears throat> Damn, it's tough. I think Forsberg first. You, you, he's going. He's gonna. He's gonna get a win this season. I mean, um, and you're gonna you're gonna let him win the championship. Here's why. I think Osbo. I don't know. I never. I never believe in new cars. So that automatically eliminates Osbo to make it eight rounds. He's only got the lead by thirty-seven points. Okay. Problem. The problem is the formula drift. You need consistency. And I just think the Corolla is going to let him down at some point. Could be wrong. Um, I already think he doesn't look like his. So I, I think his first place in championship is like a compliment to where what what I think he's driven this year. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to go James Dean second. And then I'm really torn for third between James Pichor and Kristaps. Um, Kristaps has only done two top 16s and a victory, so that's not... Yeah, I say Wysik would be the one to top. Okay. I'll go Osmo then. So I'm saying Forsberg, Dean Osmo is, is my 1-2-3 right now. I mean, I, I mean, I like that. I, I would arrange... I, I somehow think that Osmo may be the second place, but... Um, I don't really know. I'll be honest with you, but I, but I still think. But but let's talk about the podium for a second because we were. That's really what we were focused on. That podium spread is still kind of holding true. I mean, fifth place, right right around there. We still have a good a good gap between uh, Kristaps and and Wang right now. So the the that spread potentially is going to get larger, and we should we're we're narrowing in our podium is what I, what we were saying last time. Yeah, I mean, I would almost argue Kristaps is out of the championship race at this point. Uh, he's 86 points away. It's possible, but, you know, yeah. you step into sixth place, four swings, 105 points away. Yeah. Um, that basically means that he needs to, in the next five rounds, he would basically have to finish one, like, whole round above Osbo, Forsberg, and Dean for all five events, beat them all by one round of points, and he would like barely win the cha- like barely win the championship. Yeah. Yeah, I get so, that. No, uh, I, all right. So I think you've you've called it out already. We kinda jog through that. The only th- the only point from last time I think we're gonna push through and not address this time is I had mentioned that there was a possibility that I like to talk about um, for a uh, popular drift platforms that maybe aren't necessarily main platforms in FD uh, vehicle platforms we're talking about. And I think right, we can do right, that. Right. Yeah. I think we could do that at, at, at a different time. And okay. um, it was funny. One of my friends actually pointed out to me, you know, he's kind of not super into drifting, but he's been listening to the podcast. So okay. that's cool. And one of the things he said was, he said he really he's like you really should do a podcast kind of explaining for for a layman kind of what what FD is all about, right? It's probably not a bad idea. But but the only but the only <laughs> the only problem with that is is that um if it's really hard to do over a podcast, right? Right. I agree. Uh it's hard to not draw diagrams and show things like that. So uh and I'm sure that there's somewhere out there there's a video that's already done it a hundred times. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe that's in the do, or, you know, honestly, that might even be, uh, I don't even know if I'm the best person to even do that. I mean, it, it might be interesting if you could bring on, like, a Van Kirk or Kevin Lawrence or one of those guys and just talk yeah. about their progression, like, walking through, like, what they had to change, what they learned, like, hey, you showed up your first time in Pro 2, like, what was it like, you know, hey, the first time you were in Long Beach, like, what, um you know, what was different? Right. Like what was the, I don't know. I I think someone that's like lived it might have a better experience than, than, um, than us. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I, I know a lot, but it's like I'm very much like an armchair analyst of the sport, so. Yeah, and I'm kind of like the water boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right, I think uh, I think we've done it. Is there anything else that, uh, that you wanted to point out from the event? Any highlights that you wanted to go through from Atlanta? I, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that just because it's completely biased and I haven't done any plugs or anything – um, you just want to tell the world that you love Koenig wheels. I just want to tell the world that I love Koenig wheels. But before we even get to that part, um, uh, I think I was happy that Lawrence qualified. That okay, was a, that was a good thing. He was struggling. He struggled really hard with Pro Two. He didn't qualify in Pro Two. Um, he didn't qualify in Atlanta last year, right? For Pro Two, he should probably um, just skip this whole round. Yeah, I don't. Know. I mean, he like really <laughs> must hate this track. Like, yeah, probably. really bad. And I get it. It's got to be super intimidating being in a car and coming down that hill and then having to judge that first clip. I, I, I really, I mean, it, it's a high, it's a high, right? It's a pretty high speed entry and it's a good flick there. And that, that turn goes left quick. Well, let's talk about something. He lost his tire. <laughs> he did. Wait, it, it, I, there was, there was a, there was a few uh, Coney guys that lost their tire. Um, okay. Literal defeated and okay. ran the entire dan he ran the entire thing basically um on the wheel and Lawrence did the same thing. Yeah. And just so you know, those wheels are they were like not destroyed. They they made they ran the whole damn thing. If anyone wants to go back and watch, you can see evidently sparks shooting out of those corners and tire was so is gone. That, is that going to be like a new Koenig ad? I, I think that should be. I'm like, just gonna... You just got to like frame up like the wheel on the broken car and then be like, why even bother investing in tires? Or, you know, yeah. I, uh, right. you got you to gotta look <laughs> right. into that. Right. You're not going to get royalties on that if we use it. But um, okay. yeah, we're going to just name the wheel Koenig Firestarter. <laughs> But but yeah so so anyhow so yeah you're right he he debated Lawrence debated and I'm just you know he drove the whole lap on what I would say I mean obviously the wheel's not salvageable but like it stayed together better than I thought it would have and you know and and honestly I, I saw I saw a few pictures of it and it's actually in really good condition considering I mean it's pretty incredible honestly so do you think you could remount a tire on it? I think you remount the tire. I mean, I don't know that I would be like all. I mean, I wouldn't well. take it on the highway, but like you think you get like it to hold, hold air, air? The tire. It's yeah. possible, sure. Huh. It That's didn't really impressive. look. You know, look. The one thing about drift. I mean, not the rumble strips there or anything like that. But there's just so much lateral movement. You know what I mean? So right. You're not talking about uh, you know, an off road or there's a lot of dips or I mean, if you were to then if you were to repeat that on the street, I actually think it would have been a lot worse. So interesting. Well, just because you know they just repaved Atlanta, they just repaved right. that whole area, so that's a it was a fresh pave, and then on top of it, it, it's a lot of lateral movement. I'm not saying that there's not you know when you drop a when you drop a wheel off the edge of the you know the clip there and put it in the dirt, that's a whole other thing. But that's not what was happening here. He was he was a little bit more inbound and he was going laterally. So I think he just had a lot of grinding that was happening. You know what I mean? Mm. Wheel meet pavement kind of thing. So. I guess so. I mean, I just, you know, I don't know. I just imagine, like, tires falling off and, like, wheels shattering and, and things of that nature, I guess, in my head. Yeah, but that, they, I mean, nobody, nobody shattered. Nobody broke. Like, it's just, right. we just had, you know, you got a little smaller. It was like, kind of like the Flintstones, right? <laughs> I guess that's true. So, so. like, uh, are you, are, is the, is the Koenig with beadlock, are you going to? Come out with some bead locking uh, rims for your driver's seat. No, I don't think. In fact, I think the formula drift rule is that you're not allowed to have bead lock. Well, you know, I don't know. Maybe you can just start giving them some Mamba yeah. wheels. We're just going to give them some off road wheels. <laughs> That's exactly right. All right. Let's wrap this thing up. Um, for more info on the podcast, uh, well, actually, before that, uh, tell them where to find you on Instagram. Give me your uh, little handle. Uh, that would be my name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Joey Redman. Uh, I'm going to assume you know how to spell Joey, but R-E-D-M-O-N-D for the uh, spelling challenge. 
Awesome. All right. Uh, for more info on the podcast, head over to KonigWiz.com forward slash podcast. Uh, if you're enjoying this thing, uh, go ahead and uh, head over to iTunes or Google Play and give us a little subscribe. That will be fun. like to see a number. Um, you can also catch us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter and YouTube at Koenig Wheels USA. All right. We're out of here. Until next time. Peace.